train. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, in Libya, troops loyal to Muammar Gaddafi are locked in a tense fighting with opposition forces for control of several cities and towns across the country. Some of the fiercest clashes are taking place in the oil city of Azawiya, some 30 miles west of the capital of Tripoli. Gaddafi's forces have pounded the city with artillery, tanks and warplanes over the last four days. Meanwhile, government forces have launched new air raids on the eastern city of Raslanouf, where an oil installation has gone up in flames. Gaddafi has also launched a diplomatic offensive, dispatching high-ranking envoys to Cairo, Brussels, Lisbon and Malta for talks. Meanwhile, the International Committee of the Red Cross says Libya has descended into civil war with increasing numbers of wounded civilians arriving in hospitals in eastern cities. While the battles rage in Libya, calls are growing on the international community to impose a no-fly zone to cripple Gaddafi's air force. NATO defense ministers in talks today uh, discussing military options related to Libya, including a proposed no-fly zone. Last week, Defense Secretary Robert Gates told Congress he had concerns over the strategy. If it's ordered, we can do it. But the reality is, and, and people, there, there's a lot of, uh, frankly, loose talk about some of these military options, and let's just call a spade a spade. A no-fly zone begins with an attack on Libya to destroy the air defenses. That's the way you do a no-fly zone. On Tuesday, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi said in an interview on Turkish television that a no-fly zone amounted to a new colonialism. This will help us because the Libyan people are in this condition and are facing it with one face, which is against this new colonialism and against imperialism. The picture is clear that it is an attack against Libya by the enemy of Libya, whose purpose is to take control of Libya's oil, freedom, land and people. And this will make the Libyan people take up arms and fight. And in Britain, Prime Minister David Cameron spoke before the House of Commons and said he spoke with President Obama about imposing a no-fly zone. Well, first of all, what I discussed last night with uh, President Obama is making sure we plan for every eventuality, including planning for a no-fly zone. And everyone would want, if this does become necessary, to have the widest possible backing. And that is why we are currently drafting a UN Security Council resolution. I think that is absolutely uh, the right thing to do. For more on the issue of a no-fly zone, we go to Libya. Democracy Now! correspondent Anjali Comet spoke to a member of the Libyan opposition in Benghazi about foreign intervention and a no-fly zone. Well, I am Isam Giriani. I am a field member of the coalition of the 17th of February. Um, we keep very close contact with the uh, transitional, pro the, the provisional National Council. Can you explain what the position of the Council is on the issue of foreign intervention in Libya? Our position, the, the, the Provisional National Council's position was made very clear through the request that we uh, put out about five or six days ago, and it was a very logistical intervention that included a no-fly zone in position of no-fly zone over Libya, also the bombardment of certain locations uh, such as the barracks where he keeps his mercenaries, his Bab al Azizia compound, and other security, uh, security forces barracks that he has around Tripoli and near to Sabha and near to Tripoli as well. We did not request and we insist on not requesting any land troops intervention. Do you believe that international inter Prevention is needed in order to liberate all of Libya. I mean, we've been hearing lots of uh, the, the European Union and the United States and the United Nations. Uh, I wouldn't want to say they're taking their own sweet time in order to negotiate or to discuss the Libyan issue. What I would like to, I, I would like of them to realize that every day that goes on, more casualties are falling, and now with our small armed forces, the casualties have become on both sides. As long as this thug. Is is not dealt with internationally and directly, I think this situation could go on for a long time because he's got the money, which we don't, and he's got the military equipment that we don't. And finally, 
I've read a lot of commentators in the West fearing that what's happening in Libya could lead to a civil war. There is no in such possibility because civil wars needs, a, I mean, warring parties. Okay, we don't have any warring parties. We have the people of Libya on one side against Gaddafi and his thugs on the other side. That's what we have. Given that um, the international community has long held Muammar Gaddafi to be a sort of a pariah and imposed sanctions on him previously, what impact do you think sanctions or an ICC, even an arrest warrant, would have on his power? The, the military intervention that we had requested, we are quite confident that the moment that it is applied, that it is that a step towards it is taken, the, the Gaddafi regime would fall within 48 hours. We do not expect it to survive more than that. It's just a matter that right now he's, uh, he's absorbed the first shock of the revolution over the first week. And now we know that uh, daily there are mercenaries that are coming into Libya from the south and he's moving them towards the, uh, the, the north. Now, it would be a tragedy if the international community would allow him, through the use of mercenary, to retake the country. Do they think that if he retakes over the country, is there any moral ground or ethical ground to deal with such a regime? I don't know. I, I don't think so, and I believe there isn't, but some other politicians may look at it a different way, and I hope that they do not think that there is ever a possibility to deal with such a thing. Time is very, very crucial. Libya is a very small population where, I mean, even the death of one person is a big loss, let alone a death of hundreds, and today we're talking about more than 3,500 deaths that we can assume had taken place. This is ridiculous. This is shameful for the international com uh, community to allow such a massacre to take place and keep on taking their own sweet time to discuss whether to interfere or not to interfere. I think morally they're obligated to take a quick position and save this country and put a stop, put an end to the bloodshed that we're facing. Yes, I'm Gariani, a field member of the February 17th coalition, speaking to Democracy Now! correspondent Anjali Khamet in Benghazi. While calls are growing for a no-fly zone, some argue it would be a violation of international law. Richard Falk is professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University, the author of more than 50 books on war, human rights and international law, now teaching at UC Santa Barbara. We were supposed to be joined by Libyan novelist Hisham Mattar, who supports a no-fly zone, but we're unable to reach him. We'll try to reach him in the coming days. Uh, Professor Falk, welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, you heard uh, the previous speaker, one of the rebel leaders in Benghazi, who says, we are going through a massacre. We need international help. We need a no-fly zone imposed. Your response? I think it is a very uh, tragic and difficult case, but I feel that the record of intervention has been so bad, and the motivations to undertake it in a particular case and to ignore uh, similarly tragic situations in other cases makes me very suspicious of any push for military intervention under Western auspices with no consideration of whether this kind of use of force violates international law and the UN Charter. None, none whatsoever. The only uh, call for U.N. participation is based on the idea that it would be perceived as less Western, but it would be basically an American operation because only the U.S. under NATO auspices would have the logistical capabilities to do it in an effective way. And what about the issue that you raise of what this means about the so sovereignty in our in our day, uh, the and the right of sovereign states to manage their own affairs internally? Well, I think, as I say, it is a tragic thing to stand by while people are dying and uh, while a, uh, a tyrannical leader is using uh, force against his own people. At the same time, I think on balance and given the flow of history, it's better to trust in the dynamics of self-determination than to rely on great power intervention 
in order to uh, alleviate the situation. So in that sense, I would affirm the notion that Libya is a sovereign state at this stage and that the only exceptions to the non-intervention rule should be by way of the UN Security Council where the prospect of a Russian and Chinese veto make that not politically viable. Professor Falk, Professor Falk you refer to history. What are the examples of uh, when a no-fly zone was imposed that you think it didn't work? Well, I think in uh, Iraq, it uh, set the stage for both the uh, greater suffering of the Iraqi civilian population and led to a situation that eventuated in an unlawful, aggressive, and terribly destructive war. It's a rel relatively rare uh, mechanism that's been used, and for instance, it was never even contemplated when Israel attacked Gaza at the end of 2008, where the population was completely vulnerable to a massacre from the air, on the ground, and from the sea. So it's very selective in the way this kind of discourse is carried on internationally. And, and the fact that the United States already bogged down in, Af in Af still Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, uh, involved in Pakistan, in Yemen, and uh, to some degree, uh, some forces in Somalia would still have the, the, the thought of getting involved in another military uh, action uh, in the region? Yeah, and that's another whole dimension of why I think it's uh, imprudent as well as uh, probably unlawful to conceive of this option. Uh, there, it's a very unpredictable act of war, and it, as Gates indicated, it has to be preceded by an actual military attack to uh, remove the threat to the planes uh, enforcing the no-fly zone. And so I think the U.S. has already uh, dramatically overextended. It can't deal with its domestic uh, social demands, and it, it would be a real example of imperial overstretch to think that uh, the U.S. is in a position to carry out a uncertain mission of this sort, which almost certainly would expand in the process of it being executed. Richard Falk, I want to thank you for being with us, uh, Professor Emeritus of International Law, Princeton University, author of more than 50 books on war, human rights, and international law, now teaching at UC Santa Barbara.